Hello and welcome back my friends. To drive home the point of how the rule of three can work in your projects, Uncle Scott is gonna dissect the opening hook of one of his all-time favorite movies, Back to the Future. The reason why I chose this particular film is because it sets everything up perfectly in less than three minutes with almost one continuous shot using little to no dialogue and without even showing any of the main characters' faces. Whether you realize it or not, the human brain is constantly searching for new information on the screen when you're watching video content, and I'm about to show you how to use that to your advantage. But before we begin, let's all pretend like we haven't seen this movie before. That means when I ask something like, what type of person might live at this location? You shouldn't immediately blurt out, Doc Brown, because you couldn't possibly have known that yet. Like I said, act as if this is the first time your brain is absorbing the content. And if you truly haven't seen this movie before, well, then you should be ashamed of yourself. All right, now it's time to pause this video and watch the scene link in the description below. Try to pay attention to what details are being presented throughout the clip, and maybe even take notes so you can recall everything in order. Oh, and don't worry about the text credits, we're only talking about story elements here. Once it's done, come back to this video and continue with the lesson. Okay, now that we're back, let's break things down into categories of who, what, where, when, and why for every new thing that we see or hear after the Universal logo and main title card. Of course, most people wouldn't normally pay this close attention to every little detail when they're watching a movie, but the purpose of this exercise is to show you how your subconscious will register information if the rule of three presents it in a specific order. Here we go. Number one we hear the sound of ticking clocks. This is a great thematic choice considering the time travel plot of the film. But at this point, we have no idea about any characters, when or where this scene takes place, so I'll leave the other categories blank until something becomes relevant for each one. Number two, we see clocks. What might that be telling us? Perhaps another thematic choice for an opening image that relates to the time travel plot? Aside from that though, still no other information yet. Number three, we see more clocks. A lot of them in fact. What might that be telling us? Where are we? Well, my first guess might be a clock repair shop. And since we're not 100% sure about it, let's add a question mark to the end of it. Number four, we see a clock with a little man hanging from the minute hand. But most people wouldn't really notice that minor detail until they've seen the entire film and then watched it again from the very beginning. That's an example of an Easter egg, which is a cleverly hidden detail that refers to something of relevance within the story. Now, since it's not relevant to someone who's watching this for the first time, I'll just categorize it with the same question about the clock repair shop from before. Number five, we see a framed newspaper article. Notice how the camera stops moving and holds on it long enough to read the title of the article that says Brown Mansion Destroyed. Now, most people might not retain that information because it's simply a random occurrence at this point, but its purpose is to plant a subconscious seed in your mind for later in the movie. This is the first time we might start thinking about who would want to frame this and hang it on their wall and why. Since we still don't know for sure, I'll just guess that it's the clock shop owner who kept it because it's important to them for some reason. Once again, I'll add a question mark until it's officially confirmed. Number six, we see framed pictures of famous inventors. Even if you don't immediately recognize them as inventors, most people would at least understand that they're historical figures. What might this be telling us? Probably that the person involved admires them in some way or that they have similar interests. Number seven, we see a messy sleeping area with a radio alarm clock and an old school video camera, both consisting of 1980s technology. Aside from giving us information about the possible time setting, it would also be a little jarring for someone's bed to be out in the open on the showroom floor at a clock repair shop. So, does that mean that this is someone's house? If it is, I'm guessing that they're disorganized and they're also very interested in clocks. 
Number eight, we hear the radio alarm clock turn on with a commercial about the new 1985 model Toyotas. That helps to further establish the time setting in the mid 80s. Of course, the director Robert Zemeckis could have easily shown us the year with text on screen right after the main title, but he clearly wanted to do it in a more organic way. Number nine, we see an 80s era coffee maker turn on by itself and spill because there's no coffee pot underneath. Now aside from that set dressing adding just a little bit more credibility to our 1980s time frame theory, it also might suggest that the person who lives there is forgetful or absent-minded. Number 10, we see a homemade Rube Goldberg style invention where a clock lever turns on the power to an old tube television. This raises questions about who would design something like that and why is the audience being shown this right now? Perhaps it's another breadcrumb to suggest that he or she has a creative imagination. Number 11, we hear and see the TV news anchor talking about plutonium that may or may not have been stolen by Libyan terrorists. Notice how the camera intentionally pushes in on the TV and stops for a moment. Okay, so what might be the reason for this? Well, I can tell you that literally everything said or shown on screen for any noticeable amount of time should have a very specific purpose, regardless of how subtle it may appear to be at first. In this case, I'd assume that they're trying to offer some sort of foreshadowing about related events that will develop throughout the film. Oh, and judging by her shoulder pads and hairstyle, I think it's a pretty safe bet that the movie takes place in the 1980s. Number 12, we also see a graphic on the TV screen with bold text that reads plutonium theft along with a large radiation symbol. Now aside from the fact that most news networks use visual aids to go along with what their anchors are saying, it's a metaphorical tap on the shoulder for the audience to pay attention to what she's saying. The radiation symbol also serves as a reminder for how dangerous plutonium can be. Number 13, we hear an alarm go off that subconsciously justifies the camera to start moving again so the audience can see what made the noise. This is an example of something called motivated camera movement, which we'll talk more about in our cinematography lessons. Number 14, we see some sort of automated toaster malfunctioning with charred toast popping up and down. This is yet another suggestion that whoever lives there has not only been tampering with household appliances, but also that they're not home at this very moment. Number 15, we hear a buzzer noise. The main purpose of this is directly associated with the visual action that's about to happen, but it also serves as a jarring signal that tells the audience to pay attention. Number 16, we see a robotic arm contraption, open a can of dog food and dump it into an overflowing bowl with the name Einstein written on the side. Then the robotic arm drops the empty food can into a trash bin containing several other empty cans. This one single action serves as the pattern to establish multiple things about the scene. Most obvious of all, it makes the audience wonder who could possibly invent something so complicated for such a basic purpose as feeding their dog. The previous occurrences made you contemplate the individual's hobbies, but this one without a doubt solidifies the notion that he or she is indeed a wacky scientist. Secondly, the overflowing bowl of food tells us that the dog hasn't eaten from it in quite some time. Now, if we only saw that one bit of information, then we might wonder if the dog had recently passed away or something. But combining it with the previous suggestions that nobody's there, it tells us that the owner and their dog have both been gone for quite a while. Number 17, we see the front door slowly open and someone puts the key back under the welcome mat before entering. This tells us a few things. One being that this character is most likely not the person who lives there. Two, it assumes that the person entering is someone that's at least familiar with the owner as they knew about the spare key under the mat. And also because... Hello, anybody home? Number 18, we hear him call out the name Doc, Doc. and he also whistles for Einstein. Einstein. This obviously suggests that he's friends with the person who lives there, which we can now confirm is named Doc. Number 19, we hear the teenager's vocal disgust over the rotting pile of dog food. Oh, this all but proves that Doc and Einstein haven't been home in quite some time, and his voice helps establish that he's probably in his teens. Number 20, we see the character's retro style shoes, skateboard, and backpack. 
Although we don't see his face, we can safely assume that he's a teenager based on those three visuals, and that the time setting is indeed the 1980s. And finally, number 21. We see the teenager accidentally kick his skateboard into a case of plutonium hidden under the bed. This is a pretty big bombshell, pun intended. Now, this revelation wouldn't have made any sense without the previous setup about the stolen plutonium. So, in a little under three minutes of not seeing any major character's face on screen, we understand that a high school kid is close friends with a wacky scientist inventor named Doc and his dog Einstein, who both appear to be missing and that Doc is hiding stolen plutonium. This is a visual storytelling masterwork that provides a ton of relevant information to the audience, all while trying to avoid the standard methods of exposition. Message! I certainly hope you enjoyed this scene breakdown as much as I did, but full disclosure, I can't take full credit for it. My dear friend and professional associate, the handsome and talented Mark Bashian of Bash Films, originally blew my mind when he broke it down for me many years ago when I first got into the business. So a very special thanks to him and another one to you for watching. Keep up the good work and we'll see you in the next lesson.